The Shanghai Ladies String Quartet came together 24 years ago as students at the Shanghai Conservatoire of Music. The quartet was disbanded during the Cultural Revolution. They lost a vital decade of their lives as musicians. So did the Conservatoire. Western music was banned as a pernicious influence. Now it's back in full flood. Like their paintings and their poetry, music for the Chinese seems to be more about mood than about technique, more about inner feelings than any imagined objective reality. What this boy is learning is not just how to play the violin, but how to express his feelings and those of the composer through the music. The musical score and the instrument may be Western, but the feelings are Chinese. But what are the feelings? And those of the painters, the poets and the writers. And what is their view of reality? This man, Lin Hua, wrote the music specially for the quartet. On the surface, the influence seems to be all Western, Western cigarettes, Western musical notation. The scenes overlooked by the inevitable bust of the young Mozart and by the death mask of Beethoven. The painting on the wall given to him by Isaac Stern, the violinist, owes its parentage to the French Cubists. Where's the Chineseness in your music, we asked him. 在我们艺术家的思维里边呢，跟西方有点不同。西方人呢强调，他这个艺术的立场，强调对客观的尊重，强调模仿。而中国人呢强调是主观的感情，主观感情的抒发。啊，所以这个这方面是很不同的。
所以作为我来说呢，我是企图用这个西方的技术手段，表现出我们中国人的灵魂，灵魂深处的美。所以我就企图使这个东西结合起来，尽量用那个，因为我过去学校学的大部分是西方的一些音乐的技术，那我想把这个东西和中国音乐思维这个灵魂结合起来。比如说那个《三重奏》这么一首曲子，它本来就来自民族音乐，就是我们的民间乐器。嗯，它有很多它那种演奏手法，比如说它这种地方。就是要模仿我们民族音乐，表达人的思想感情的这些东西，所以我们一定要结合这些东西。不结合的、不印进去的话，那就不像中国作品了。所以我们是用了这些。当演奏那个《三重奏》《阳关三叠》的时候呢，就想起了王维的这首古诗，就想起这个跟。朋友告别的时候，那个难过的心情，这种有很多话要说，但是呢，又要依依不舍的写别再见了，就有很多要表达的。Travelers in green with willows new. Please, gentlemen, empty another glass of wine. Westward, out of Yang Gate, no more friends. An artist in China is at the same time a painter, a poet, and a calligrapher. Wang Wei was as famous for his paintings as for his poetry. Someone said of him, "His pictures are poems, and his poems pictures. The poems survive, but the pictures are lost." A Chinese poem gives its audience not just a musical, a verbal, and an emotional experience, but also a visual one. Through the individual characters that make up the poem, characters that can be so dense with meaning that they almost defy translation into our relatively threadbare alphabet. These apartment blocks are in the southern city of Guilin. As is usual, the tenants are a mixture of bureaucrats, truck drivers, factory workers, and waitresses. For them, it represents good living space and relative luxury. Compared to the villages in the lush countryside that surround them, it's a visual and aesthetic desert. This is the environment in which Li Gang is growing up. When we filmed him, he was eight. He's an extraordinary boy, a brilliant mathematician, and a painter of bamboo in the classical style. He plays like a child, but his real passion in life is bamboo. He describes it in words that are as sparse as his brushstrokes. He said that he admires it because it has the strength of bones and the lightness and suppleness of grass. Neither of his parents have any talent for mathematics or painting. His father is unemployed, and his mother works as a waitress. 
His classical style in painting seems strongly at odds with the 20th century toys and bric-a-brac that surround him. The girl in the picture is his sister. She's 12 and a painter too. Painting in China was always more than a profession. It was a way of life. It called for no elaborate materials or techniques. It was supposed to speak simply from the power of its basic inspiration. Painters preferred white paper and plain black ink. They added few colors, just as they add no milk to their tea to improve its flavor. In a picture, the emptiness of the paper, the white space, is as important as the black lines. The image that's never painted, but implied, is just as important as the one that is. It's a very Chinese idea. If Li Gang had been born a thousand years ago, he would have painted the same bamboo in the same style, with the same brush, on the same paper. The brilliance of the classical painter lies not in innovation, but in virtuoso conformity to a rigid set of rules, as rigid yet as liberating as the notes on a stave for the musician. Lao Tse, the father figure of Taoism, is supposed to have said 2,500 years ago, give people a void to look at and simplicity to hold, then they will have little selfishness and few desires. We asked Li Gang to show us his favorite pictures and tell us the difference between good painting and bad. He pointed to the painting on the right, the one he didn't like much. The painter is called Huang Yongyu. He lives in Beijing, but comes from a town in the deep south of China. Its name in Chinese means Phoenix. That's where he draws his inspiration. It's the constant subject of his paintings. Most of the people in the town come from a fiercely independent minority called the Miao. They have a great history as mountain warriors, 
and keep their distinctive architecture as intact as their way of life. Huang Yongyu's been painting the town since he was a boy. Now he's the owner of the family house where he was brought up. It's made of stone and wood. The town of Phoenix is surrounded by mountains and trees and clouds cast into shapes that can seem more unreal to the Western eye than a painter's wildest dreams. The big question that faces the artist is whether to attempt to capture the literal outline and texture of the shapes or the spirit, the unnameable Taoist essence. Uh 你要简练地画出来才能达到这种要求才能达到。For most classical artists, man has been an insignificant figure in a vast landscape. The old master painter Wang Wei said, when painting landscape, use your instincts more than your brush. Allow 10 feet for mountains, a foot for trees, an inch for horses, and a tenth of an inch for human figures. For the Buddhists and the Taoists, man is seen as insignificant when compared to nature. Even life itself is an illusion. The whole universe is a dream, more of an illusion than a painting. Zhuang Zhu, the Taoist philosopher, speculated on the nature of reality, and like any present-day quantum physicist, concluded that he might just as well be a butterfly dreaming that he was a man, as a man dreaming that he was a butterfly. For him, like the modern physicist, there was no one reality, but rather a multitude of subjective realities, each one real for its individual observer. The Buddhist saying, phenomenon is emptiness, emptiness is a kind of phenomenon, pervades the artist's view of the landscape and their pictures. What can be transmitted is not literal reality, but a mood, an impression of some unspeakable, unpaintable, unhearable, unimaginable reality. Wang Chaowen lives in the northern part of Beijing. He used to be a sculptor. Then he turned to writing on the theory and aesthetics of art. During the Cultural Revolution, like many of the artists that he wrote about, he was thrown into prison. Now he's out and writing again. Chang 
棋有什么好看的？我感觉得你从几个角度看，或者说从几个角度看，它有玩意儿，有内容。你不能确定它究竟是一个什么东西，不能确定它究竟是一个嗯、呃、什么动物，因为它不给我们提供标本，它给我们提供这种美的对象。我们从他发现艺术家的长处是发现他跟我们的感情有联系的东西，那个那个那个美的东西，那个那个真正是能感动人的东西，所以这个是客观存在，又是我们这艺术家自己的主观的一个感受，没有主观的感受，这个客观存在对我作为艺术家来讲是不存在的。Intellectuals have long played a contradictory role in China. Part of the elite expected to serve the emperors as loyal officials, not all that different from the kind of conformity expressed by Li Gang and Lin Hua in the segment we've just seen. But over and over, intellectuals have asserted themselves as the conscience of the state and society. With me today are Professors Rhodes Murphy and Stephen Goldstein. Professor Murphy, historically, have the intellectuals in China been conformists or dissidents? Uh, well, they've been both, but primarily conformists. That was ensured and really, in a way, enforced, inculcated by the imperial examination system, which is what made you an intellectual. This was the small group of educated men, no women, sorry, uh, maybe 2% of the total population, uh, who uh, studied the classics and then passed the three tiered set of examinations. From which then would be chosen people to serve as officials,、uh, teachers, and then if you were literate and had the skills that you acquired from studying the classics, you might be a writer, an artist, a poet.、Um, but the Confucian classics, which was the center of all this, was very conformist, conservative, status quo. At the same time, Confucianism、uh, supported the idea of. The upright man, as Confucius called it, so these people were also the keepers of morality, of uprightness, and that meant that they sometimes had a role to criticize rulers and other officials, to point to deficiencies in their own society around them. Was this done more in terms of a loyal opposition, or did intellectuals assume a more Vocal and outspoken role in opposing a whole regime historically.、Uh, rarely the latter. Sometimes, particularly as the dynasty in power began to lose effectiveness and honesty in its last years, many of the intellectuals would join a, pro a, a rebellious group with the objective of establishing a new dynasty.、Uh, but there was a tension always between the. Uh, the loyalty、uh, and conformity taught by the Confucian classics, on the one hand, and the message that they were supposed to be the keepers of the national conscience, on the other, and the two didn't always go together. But most people, I think, felt that,、uh, as in any other society, don't make waves if you want to get ahead. So they they were conformists more often than dissidents, but they were also the latter. Were there times when the emperors? Themselves acted against、uh, intellectuals, moved to crush intellectuals. Oh, definitely, and that was a dangerous role to play. And many of them paid for it with their lives. They criticized the emperor, or they criticized official policy because they thought that was their Confucian duty,、uh, and they would invoke the displeasure of the emperor or of some higher placed official, and they would be beheaded, or executed in some fashion, or sent off into exile. In any case, punished. Professor Stephen Goldstein, to what extent do these historic themes reappear in the China of after the Communist Revolution in 1949? Well, they they reappear in a very interesting way, actually.、Um, when Mao Zedong and the Communist Party took power in 1949, they were greeted by the intellectuals. There was some concern, some undercurrent about how freedom of inquiry, freedom of speech, might be. Might be affected, but most of all, Mao was seen as a nationalist who would make China a great nation again. And many of in, many of the intellectuals、uh, flocked to the Communist Party. Many came from abroad in order to take part in what、um, they saw as a very、uh, a very exciting enterprise: the rebuilding of China. 
By the end of the 1950s, I think that relationship soured. Uh, on the part of the intellectuals, they, they became restive and uh, they became uh, impatient uh, with the increasing restrictions put on them by the Communist Party. Mao himself became distrustful of the intellectuals. By the 60s, with the Cultural Revolution, um, it, there's no other way to put it except to say that Mao had become anti-intellectual. Uh, they were known as the stinking ninth category. Mao saw them as a, uh, as a carrier of some of the uh, foreign values and some of the traditional elitist values that would undermine his vision of socialism. Uh, the Cultural Revolution was in many ways nothing less than a war against the intellectuals. Um, after Mao's death in 76, the new regime tried once again to harness the energies, harness the talents, of the intellectuals uh, to their efforts to modernize, to transform China. Uh, and once again, there was a brief honeymoon period. Of course, all that changed again with Tiananmen. Uh, and what I think is so interesting um, about China as it enters the 1990s is that Mao's successors uh, find themselves once again uh, viewing the intellectuals as Mao did. Uh, as the carriers of uh, values, uh, now the term that's used is peaceful evolution, um, values often from abroad uh, that will undermine socialism. And Tiananmen proved it for them. How do the intellectuals view themselves and their own role in this new period after Tiananmen Square? Much as Rhodes Murphy has put it, they, viewed themselves, they view themselves as the conscience of the nation, the spokesman of the nation, not, interestingly enough, the spokesman of the people necessarily. They're not Democrats. Uh, they view themselves as e individuals with a special responsibility. Very briefly, why do they have this unusual clout in Chinese society? Uh, because of the traditional prestige, uh, certainly vis-a-vis -vis the masses, uh, but also because they have talents and they have um, knowledge uh, that the regime needs. Thanks very much. In our next segment, a closer look at the tensions surrounding the role of intellectuals and artists in Chinese society.